Uh, so this is Jonathan Corbett presenting his talk on what I've learned as the kernel docs maintainer. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I thought I'd start off with an inspirational quote that I found from Neil Brown, actually, who stumbled across as I was preparing this talk. Um, it says that maintainers tend to get to be maintainers because they're good at something else, not necessarily being good at maintainers, and they were bad at hiding from the maintainer role. And one of the requisite skills is being able to say no to things, but if they were, they would never agree to be a maintainer in the first place. <laughs> I, I think he nailed it pretty well. So. Back in 2014, I, um, I had a moment of weakness and I failed to hide from the, the role of the kernel docs maintainer um, after having escaped it a couple of times. So I thought I'd put together a talk on, on how it works and what I've learned and where I think things are going. So there's three basic parts of the talk. A very brief, very brief introduction to the kernel development model. Talk a little bit about what maintainers in general do and then get into the, um, the documentation aspect of it in particular. So, the Linux kernel, of course, I expect this audience knows what it is, the core of any Linux system. I went and did a quick look. There's 53,000 and some files in the Linux source tree at this point, contained in about 3,700 directories. So, fair amount of stuff. We put out a release about every nine weeks, about every 63 days. Each one of these releases contains work from about 1,600 developers, contributing about 12,000 changes every 63 days. So, that's a lot of stuff. This is a big and fast-moving project. It is arguably the biggest and fastest-moving such out there. A lot going on. So when you have something operating on this scale, you have to think pretty, pretty clearly about how it is organized, how it works, so the whole thing is just going to collapse under its own weight. And in fact, we risked to do that a couple of times over the years. What we have evolved in the, in the kernel community is a structure that looks more or less like this. We have a hierarchy. We have lots of developers contributing patches. Those patches go to maintainers who will look at the, the patches, review them, decide whether to accept them or not, and so on, collect them, perhaps pass them up to higher level maintainers who may or may not look at them again, and so on up the tree until you get to Linus up at the top end of it there. Um, John O'Bacon this morning described the kernel community as a dictatorship as such. And I can say you can see it that way, but I would put forward that what we actually have is something more like a classic governmental bureaucracy, where you've got your patch, and you have to go, and you have to get it stamped by the appropriate people, and then you can finally submit it for inclusion. There's, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on at the various levels of this bureaucracy, and it's not that Linus is there making decisions on every one of thousands and thousands of patches. So in fact, if you look at the 4.4, development cycle, the most recent one we completed, we, we merged 13,000 patches in this development cycle. Linus himself merged 20 of them. Everything else came in by way of the maintainers. So the maintainer structure is doing its job of, of pulling the work away from Linus so that he doesn't go nuts and spreading it out. It's a distributed maintenance structure. So we have a lot of people fitting into this, this hierarchy in various places to, to make this whole thing work. So, what do they do? Well, one of the first things you learn when you get into the maintainer role, or if you even look at it, is it's really not about writing code, or even about writing documentation. It's pretty much the same sort of thing that happens that we've all seen when some engineer that you know who's very good at engineering gets promoted into management. All right, it's a different set of skills, and they may or may not be good at it. It's, it's a very different sort of thing. So, what do they do? Obviously, it's about reviewing patches. You have to look at patches, decide if they're appropriate for the kernel, if they're in good enough shape, and so on. Or, of course, what you really want to do is to get other people to review the patches for you. Because uh, there are a lot of practical reasons for this. Even a maintainer who understands a specific subsystem very well still does not have all the hardware associated with it, doesn't understand every corner, needs people with more expertise to look at them, that sort of thing. But also, Maintainers, like everyone else, are lazy and would rather be out riding their bicycles. So this is a classic aspect of kernel development, is trying to get other people to do the work for you. Um, it's, it's really key to being successful in that community. But if you're actually going to do some of the work and get down to patch review, how do you do it? Well, obviously, what you have to do to review kernel patches is make sure there's no 81 character lines. <laughs> because kernel developers still work on VT100 terminals. <laughs> 
But um, seriously, there's a whole lot of aspects. I, I had a bunch of slides on patch review, and I had to take them out because I didn't have time. could do a whole talk just on patch review. But the, perhaps the most important question is, is the patch trying to solve the right problem? It's surprisingly often somebody will come in and say, well, I have a patch that does this, and you think, okay, it looks like a nice patch, but why do you want to do this? People often don't really think things through, or they don't understand other aspects of the kernel, whatever. So you have to answer that question first. Is it actually trying to solve the right problem? Then, does it actually solve the problem correctly? Does it introduce security holes? Does it perform correctly, and so on? Have all the process issues been handled correctly? Has everybody who should see the patch actually seen it and had an opportunity to comment on it? Does they have the right sign-offs? That sort of thing. The rubber stamps I was talking about before. We do it pretty literally. And, of course, we have to say, is the work actually documented properly? But actually, I'm messing with you again, because nobody actually cares about the documentation side. <laughs> so once you've decided that a patch is in good shape, well, you have to queue it up. In the early days of Linux development, the development process was very lossy. People would send in patches, they would fall through the cracks and disappear, and they'd have to send them again and again. Led to a lot of frustration. Uh, led to, yeah, led to a lot of unhappiness in the community. We don't really have that anymore, partly because we have good tools. So that we can collect these patches and move them up. So maintainers have to be very careful about collecting patches and making sure that they'll get to where they need to be, making decisions about which release they should go into. Is this a feature patch that needs to wait for the next merge window, or perhaps even longer if it's a very intrusive sort of patch? Is it something that needs to be sent off to the stable trees? That sort of thing. Once you've decided all that sort of stuff, of course, what you have to do is eventually send the patches upstream to the next level maintainer which leads to an interesting question of just how to, do you do that? Remember this diagram they put up of our nice multi-level hierarchy of how the patches would go up here, kind of corresponding to the kernel source code tree. For 4.4, I went in and I traced the paths that the patches actually followed on the way into the kernel. And I made a little diagram. Um, I'm going to have to apologize in advance because the fonts on this next slide might be just a little bit hard to read. <laughs> um, because we're dealing with something like 150 trees. So let's zoom in. This is a piece right up at the top here. That piece right there is Dave Miller's net next tree. Right? That's where all of the feature work for the networking subsystem goes in. So what we see is that we do, in fact, have maintainers feeding patches into that tree from various other subsystem trees. That's the net filter tree. That's the uh, Bluetooth tree. That's the wireless tree. That's the network drivers tree, things like that. And some of them even drop down a couple more layers below that. So we have something that looks sort of like that hierarchy of patches flowing into the kernel. You can go down a little bit further. This is Dave Early's DRM tree, the graphics tree. And so we have something that's flatter here where we have a whole bunch of maintainers managing specific subsystems, usually a specific driver, a specific hardware subsystem. And they feed them up to Dave, he collects them all, and sends them up to Linus. But what we have for the most of that diagram was stuff that looks like this. And again, you don't really have to read them. The point is that we have a lot of trees feeding straight to the main line. That's the main line there. Almost every repository maintained by a kernel maintainer feeds directly to Linus, directly into the main line repository. They almost all push directly there. And it's an interesting outcome, because it doesn't quite match the, the diagram that was there. Now, it's a kind of an aphorism in kernel circles that you should design things in layers and implement them flat for performance reasons. And I think that's partly what's happened here. We just, we don't need the middlemen. We can do it this way. It gives Linus a better chance to look over things and understand what's going on throughout the tree and so on. If we were ever to run into more scalability issues, we would be able to interpose more mid-level maintainers and try to deal with that. But that doesn't seem to be the issue for now. But what this does mean is that almost anybody who wants to be a kernel subsystem maintainer has to be able to talk to Linus, has to get Linus's trust and learn how to uh, put together pull requests and so on in ways that don't cause Linus to start talking to you in that obscure Finnish dialect of his <laughs> um, that tends to be um, not always pleasant to read. So, once you've pushed things up, you're not done because some of the stuff that you merge is going to break things. It just happens. That's life. So we have a pretty strong policy in the kernel that we don't ship the kernel with known regressions. If something that works in a current kernel breaks in a kernel going forward, 
that, that, that is really bad for our users. It's just not something that we want to have happen ever, if possible. That's an ideal that's hard to reach, but we try. So if you as a maintainer fed up a patch that broke something, then you as the maintainer have to take responsibility for fixing that in one way or another. That usually means talking to the developer who gave you the patch and finish, um, or else just putting in a revert to pull it out entirely and try again in a future development cycle, that sort of thing. The, the whole aspect of being around to follow up is an important part of kernel development as a whole. In a more general sense, you have to keep an eye on the overall direction that you want your subsystem to go. So if you've got APIs you're trying to move away from, you don't want to be adding patches that use it, or you want them to go towards APIs that you are aiming towards. If you're seeing that certain kinds of code are being duplicated throughout the subsystem, you want to try to push things towards doing that work in common code, so you only have one version of it, things like that. That's the maintainer's job to push developers and make that happen, which often means pushing back on patches and saying, no, this needs to be done in this other way so that things are moving the way we want them to go in the long term. Because there's, there's always a whole lot of things you want to see happen in this sort of subsystem. It takes years to get there. You have to make sure each patch takes you a little bit closer to it. And then finally, on this list, is talking to the world. Maintainers need to help bring in new developers and bring them into your way of doing things, go out to conferences and give talks, um, that sort of thing. Work with companies that want to get code into the kernel to support their stuff, or should be wanting to get code into the kernel to support their stuff, to help them to do it properly, that sort of thing. And this is all stuff that a maintainer has to do, none of which, again, is really about writing code, which, in fact, is why often people who do a lot of subsystem maintenance don't actually put a lot of patches into the kernel anymore, even though that was what they were good at when they started it. So, so much for the, the general stuff. What about the documentation tree? So, the documentation tree in the kernel is centered under the, the documentation directory. This is the only top-level directory in the kernel tree that starts with a capital letter, so we know it's important. <laughs> there, are, there are about 2,200-some files in the documentation tree contained in 230-ish directories, so a fair amount of stuff, adding up to about 23 megabytes of material, right, just in the documentation tree. I'm not counting the device tree, documentation slash device tree in that, by the way. That's more stuff. That is, is, that is not stuff that I maintain and is meant to move out of the kernel tree entirely one of these years, although I don't see much urgency in making that happen. There's also some stuff spread around in the um, scripts directory and arguably some of the stuff that's in the samples directory is, is documentation as well. It serves that purpose. Some of it has moved out of there. What's in the documentation directory is actually in two pieces. There is a collection of files, just ordinary text files, no special format, whatever. There's to over 2,000 of these, quite a few of them. Some of them are um, current and comprehensive and useful and so on. If you go and you read, say, documentation slash memory barriers dot text, you will come away a lot smarter or insane or both. Um, some of the other ones are, l well, less so. Let's just leave it at that. So there's a lot of that sort of stuff in there. Then there's a directory called docbook, which has a bunch of what I'm calling formatted documentation, stuff that actually is, has a markup language and can be formatted out in various formats, such as PDF, if you're lucky, um, HTML, man pages, and so on. There's 34 of these what are called template files, each of which covers one specific subsystem. The, the formatted documentation is pretty much exclusively aimed at kernel developers. It's, it's API documentation from people working within the kernel. The stuff that's in the, the rest of the documentation tree is, is a mixed bag. Some of it's for users, some of it's for developers, and some of it I'm not quite sure who it's for. And there's a little bit more beyond those, all that stuff I've just been talking about in what's called kernel doc comments. There are comments that look like this found throughout the kernel source. They're all indicated by this slash double star opening marker on the comment saying this is a kernel doc comments, what the tools look for. You've got a synopsis line saying what's being documented. In this case, it's the list add function. Describe the parameters to it or if it's a structure, structure fields, things like that. And then the description of what it is you're actually documenting. So every one of these comments follows more or less this format in the kernel. 
He said they can describe things like data structures as well as functions. They can contain documentation that's not really attached to any particular function, but describes stuff that's going on in the file as a whole, that sort of thing. And um, in the 4.5 kernel, I did a quick grab, there's about 55,000 of these. So we have quite a bit of documentation that is spread out throughout the kernel source itself. And again, um, some of it is, is more current than others, but this stuff tends to be a little bit more current than the rest. So a lot of stuff. So as I have come up to speed with maintaining this stuff, I've, I've noticed some interesting aspects of, of how the documentation tree works. Starting with the simple fact that if you want to maintain kernel documentation, you really need a good view of the kernel tree as a whole. If you are maintaining, say, the SCSI subsystem, you need to understand SCSI very well. You need to understand SCSI drivers very well. You don't really need to have any idea of what's going on in the Bluetooth subsystem or over in memory management or how the NFS file system works. The kernel documentation, though, covers the entire kernel. And so while don't perhaps have to have the same in-depth knowledge, need to know enough to understand whether any particular bit of documentation makes sense or not. So, for example, this is a patch that came in from a well-meaning developer some months back. You don't really have to read it. The point is that he was trying to add a description to a file called kernel parameters.txt, which describes all of the, the boot time parameters that can be passed to the kernel. So this is a file that in itself covers the entire kernel. And he found uh, an option he was using that was not described there. So he put together a description and sent it to me. And I said, okay, fine, yeah, this makes sense. We should be documenting these things. But maybe I should go and look at the, the source and make sure that it's actually describing things the way I think they actually work. So when I go and I look and I find out, in fact, there is no such boot parameter in the kernel at all. This is something that Red Hat added to its enterprise kernel and never sent upstream. And so if I had, in fact, taken this patch, I would have made the documentation worse. And I would have created some kind of confusion for somebody down the line somewhere when they're trying to figure out why this option doesn't work for them when the documentation says it should. So everything that comes in has to be evaluated with this lens. Is it correct? Does it matter? And sometimes I can get other subsystem maintainers to look at things and to send me acts and so on, but I really can't count on that. Often I have to figure that out by myself. Another interesting aspect, and most kernel subsystems are very well contained to a subtree of the, of the kernel source tree. But so any particular maintainer knows that they are the only one accepting patches for that particular subtree. But everybody messes with the documentation tree. There are a lot of patches that change documentation in one way or another. And some of the documentation changes come through me. I'd say the bulk of them do not. They go through various other subsystem maintainers who, are, who take them along with the, the code changes that the documentation changes reflect. It makes sense. At least an interesting question, is documentation slash SCSI really part of the documentation tree? Or is it part of the SCSI tree? Some maintainers see it one way, other maintainers see it the other way. And I'm having to figure out how each one wants to deal with this over time. The other interesting aspect of this, in the kernel we have a script called get maintainer. You feed it a patch and it gives you back a list of everybody you should mail it to. Anything that touches the documentation tree will be identified by this patch as having, as should be sent to me. I get a lot more mail than I used to get. I, I get a substantial portion of, of the patches going into the kernel go into my mailbox which isn't necessarily what I had really needed. It was more mail. The other aspect of this is that we have all those kernel doc comments. So the documentation tree also extends out into the rest of the kernel source tree. I will often get patches that will change both the documentation in the documentation tree and some subset of the comments in the source code as well. I typically can't take those, because if you send up a, a patch, a pull request to Linux with stuff that reaches into other people's subsystems like that, you tend to get back an answer and finish. So I really have to, I have to push those over to the other maintainers when I can, but I can't always do it. There aren't always maintainers to do it. There, there's a fair amount of unmaintained code in the kernel. So I have to make those decisions and, and somehow sometimes reach into the rest of the kernel as well. It's, there's a, the, the boundaries here are very fuzzy in that regard. <laughs> 
Some subsystems are quite well defined and what they do it fits the USB subsystem. You know you want it to make USB devices work as well as possible, that sort of thing. There's no real vision for the kernel documentation directory. Things just sort of get tossed into it wherever and whenever and then forgotten over time. Rob Landley was once the, the documentation maintainer and he described it as a gigantic mess currently organized based on where random passers-by drop things and then, as they went by last, right? He said this in 2007, and it really hasn't changed since then. It hasn't gotten any better at all. It is a mess. And just as a way of, of illustrating that, if you go into the documentation directory, the top level, and type ls, what you get is that. So anytime you see a directory listing this long, you know that you're probably in for trouble, right? Especially if it's something you're supposed to be able to actually go and find things in. So we have everything from, say, memory barriers that text I described to you before, which is very detailed kernel developer documentation. We have documents on how to do kernel development itself. We have translations. We have things like, at the very end there, Zorro.txt, which describes the Zorro bus that was attached to Amiga computers, which um, I am sure has not been touched for quite a while. So it's all just kind of thrown in together like that. When Rob was the, the maintainer, he came up with this plan. He was going to shuffle it all around and organize it all in one big fell swoop. Um, he didn't get very far with that. But um, I think I may attempt this again at some point, perhaps in a more gradual sort of mode. The other aspect to the fact that there's no real vision to it and such is that there's no linkage, no relationships between documents. Each document is a silo, a world unto itself. They don't reference the other documents. There's certainly no way of creating actual cross-references between them and so on. Each one is just sort of there. It's by itself. There is no comprehensive set of kernel documentation. There are 2,000-some documents instead. So that, of course, also does not help with the process of finding things or uh, doing something useful with it. On a different front, an interesting aspect of, of the kernel documentation tree is it's an entry point to kernel development. There are a lot of people who would like to get into kernel development. We have typically somewhere between two and 300 brand new developers in every development cycle. That's a lot of people coming in. Some of these people can show up with a beautiful driver or whatever on their first appearance and do wonderful things. A lot of other people are a lot more nervous about how they can engage with the kernel community, whether they can get patches accepted at all, how the process works, and so on. So they look for something easy to do. Some of these people, quite a few of them, go through and make coding style changes to the code, which is, is easy to do. It's rather controversial, whatever. Some of them decide instead that what they can do is fix things like typos in the kernel documents. Now, I think this is great, actually. I'm happy to help these people get started with kernel development. I think that fixing typos in the documents only makes them better. I'm glad to get those patches, and I encourage them, and I take them. But it leads to some interesting things. Here's one that I got a while back, and call attention to that hunk in particular there. This is, the file is documentation slash how to. This is supposed to be the, the root level document on how to do kernel development. So the, the paragraph in question is talking about installing a new kernel. So as the kernel file is usually installed in slash vm linux or slash boot slash vm linux, whatever, and you save a copy over the existing kernel, then in capitals, you must rerun lilo or you will not be able to boot your system. So if you read this stuff, you'll see some problems immediately. One, I bet nobody has a system in the room whose kernel actually goes by any of those names at that point. We don't keep it in the root. There's usually versions on them. You rarely copy over a kernel anymore. You install a new one. OK, so that's wrong. And I would be surprised if anybody in the room has a machine, well, maybe not in this room, but I'd be fairly surprised if anybody is running Lilo. Right? Lilo is a really nice bootloader from the 1990s. It hasn't been maintained for quite a while. It did have this interesting feature that if you installed a new kernel and forgot to run Lilo to build the block map to tell the bootloader where the kernel was, then you couldn't boot that kernel. Um, it was a surprise many of us encountered at least once in our lives. Now we have Grub, which doesn't have that problem. It replaced it with about, well, a large number of other problems. <laughs> um, 
So the point is that this paragraph is, is bogus, right? It should not be in our main kernel document on how to do kernel development. It should be fixed up to describe how things are done in this millennium. So I got this patch, and what this guy decided was, well, we had two exclamation points there, and that's too many. We need one. And so I got a little frustrated because to see people neatening up something that's just overtly wrong says to me that their, their goal is not to make things better, right? That, and that they don't really understand what they're doing. So I am not unique in having to deal with this sort of stuff. There are people who do this kind of thing all around the kernel tree. But it's, it's, always, it's hard to know how to respond to it because you don't really want to discourage people who in some way want to get, make things better. I mean, some of them perhaps just want their name in the, in the change log, I don't know. But in general, I think people want to make things better. But you have to tell them, sorry, this is not, not useful. We need something that actually makes the documents better. So that's sort of the, it's, anyway, that's, that's a tour of some of the things I have found interesting with kernel development. What I want to do is to get into now some of the details of the formatted documentation, which if not the heart of kernel documentation, I like to think is maybe the future of it, because this is the stuff that is more actively worked on and curated, at least parts of it are, not all of it is. The, the formatted stuff has some real advantages in that much of the actual documentation, most of it, is in the source code itself, not in a separate documentation file. This is useful, in fact, it is so useful that at the kernel summit a few months back, Linus said we should just use that and forget all the rest of it, not even bother to try to format it. But I don't agree with that, and others don't. But it is useful to have the documentation in the source where people who are working on the source will find it. It's right there next to what they're working on. It's a useful place for it. There is also this really nice idea that if a kernel developer is making a change to the source and the documentation is right there next to what they're changing, that they will, of course, remember to change the documentation while they're changing the source. Um, sometimes that actually happens. Um, other times it doesn't, and sometimes they break the documentation build, but they don't actually build the documents, so they don't know it, and then I get email. So it allows the, the creation of integrated documents that rather than just having a, you know, a little file describing one piece of the kernel, you can create a bigger file describing an entire API, an entire subsystem, that sort of thing. So it allows us within limits in that each one of these template files of the about three dozen that we have is still a world to itself. They don't refer to each other. They, aren't, they don't make one comprehensive document. We have three dozen rather less comprehensive do documents, but it's a step in the right direction anyway. There are numerous output formats if you can figure out how to make the tool chain work and all that sort of stuff. And there's an active interest, at least in some areas, in actually improving the situation, which, which is a good thing. And the, the larger documentation tree, it's not clear how much interest there is. So there's some good things, but you know, whenever I put up a list like this, you know something's coming. So there are some, some pathologies here, but I think what it really comes down to in the end, you can summarize it in one sentence, which is this. You know, if you were to decide that it's wise to go off and build your own documentation formatting system with your own tools for extracting stuff from the source and your own formatting directives and your own cross-referencing mechanism and so on, if you really thought it was a good idea to do that rather than using something that's out there already, you might not pick kernel developers to do it for you. You might pick somebody who actually, say, willingly programs in user space and who might actually care about what the output looks like and things like that. So what we have is something that was put together by kernel developers using a lot of duct tape. So how does it work? Suppose you go to the top level kernel directory and you say, make HTML docs, meaning I want the documents formatted up as HTML files so that I can look at them in a web browser. What happens is a, a program called docproc, a little C program, runs, and it parses the template file. Template files look like this. I've taken just a piece of it. The first line is just docbook stuff. There's a fair amount of this stuff, depending on how much stuff you've written in the template file itself in the docbook language. And then we have these weird little exclamation point lines, which are directives understood by docproc itself. So the first one says, grab all of the documentation for all of the exported functions out of live slash vsprintf.c. 
the next two lines grab documentation for specific functions, and then we've got another one grabbing all the exported functions at the end. So each one of these lines is going to cause the documentation to be extracted from a specific kernel source file. So for each of these files, the docpoc program will go through and it will read the source code file itself and parse it. So you've got this little C program doing its own parsing of another C program to find the export symbol directives in particular. So it knows which symbols have been exported from those files. Once it has made that list, it calls a Perl program that's in the scripts directory to go through and read the source file again to get a list of all the things that are documented within that source code file. And it gets that list. It then mixes the two lists together to come up with a list of what it actually wants to produce and calls kernel doc again to, to go through and actually extract all the documentation. So we've now made three passes over the source file to do this. Kernel doc is putting out all these little snippets in kernel doc, which then gets stuffed into the template file. So we now have this, this big doc book file that has all of the, the in-source documentation formatted up and put it into, put into it. Runs another little Perl script called kernel doc XML ref to find the cross references. This is actually very new. We've only had this capability for a few months. But it's, it's nice. If you have documentation for function f that, that takes structure s as a parameter, and structure s is defined in that same file, described in that same file, it's nice to be able to click on it and actually get to the documentation for that structure. That sort of thing. So we have it, but it only works again within a single template file. We still have no cross-references across files, just within it. So anyway, this thing goes through and mungs up the template, makes a new version of it, at which point it is fed to, this, to the XML2 file uh, utility to actually produce the output. So we've got a bit of a house of cards here, all kind of taped together. And it has some, some problems with it. It's quite slow. It is, um, I think, a sad statement in life when it takes longer to build your documents than it takes to build the kernel. <laughs> and this is not something that is caused by the volume of the documentation. It's quite brittle. It's, first of all, it's, it's hard to set up in the first place. I've had numerous kernel developers tell me they've just given up on being able to build the, the documents because it's hard to get there. The, the doc book tool chain is a pain in its own right. It's all kind of a pain to set up. But it's also easy to make changes to the source code anywhere in the kernel source directory that will break the documentation build. And as I said, kernel developers rarely actually build the documents. So they don't notice this. And then I get an email saying, hey, the documentation doesn't build. And I have to try to figure out what broke it and come up with a patch and fix it and send it in, that sort of thing. This is a fairly regular sort of thing. The kernel doc comments have no real formatting inside of them other than the, the stuff for listing out parameters and so on. If you want to format things more nicely, use different fonts, put in tables, that sort of stuff, within the, the comments themselves, you cannot do it. So it limits the expressiveness of what you can put into there. The results are, are not the most attractive thing in the world. Let's just say that kernel developers don't spend much time on style sheets. Um, it's, it's not really their, their thing. And there's no integration with the rest of the documentation directory. We have 2,000 documentation files out there that we can't pull into any of this stuff. They're all completely separate from it. So it's, it's got problems. It is, it is far from a perfect setup here. And, but it's been this way for a long time. It hasn't really changed much for quite a while until fairly recently when we started to see some stuff. So I started getting some patches from Daniel and from Daniel Cesar Lemes de Paula, I assume is how you would say that. The, added a, an interesting capability, which was rather than having unformatted text in the kernel doc comments in the source code, let's format them in Markdown. They're already essentially formatted in Markdown. And just sort of allow the ability to add extra directives to it. And then turn those actually into doc book, put them into the document. And we'd have some more cap expressive capability in the in-source documents so that you could add a lot more information. In particular, you could add tables. We had some nice patches taking tables out of the docbook formatted template files. A table in docbook is not fun, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's really not a thing of beauty. A table in something like Markdown is, is rather easier to deal with. You can actually read it, for example, which you cannot do with the original source. This was later switched to ASCII doc for various reasons. And uh, it added a, nice, a number of nice capabilities. Right? It allows us to move more documentation into the source because we can now express things the way we want to. Uh, 
um, helps to avoid writing that stuff in DocBook, that sort of thing. And in general, hopefully, I mean, practically, I think, leads to better documentation, which is what we want to have. But, of course, there are some downsides here. This whole thing adds a whole new tool to this house of cards that we had already. So we've taken something that's already pretty rickety and easy to break, and we've added something else to it. Um, among other things, this has added some very interesting disagreements between tools, where we have things like ASCII doc or Markdown arguing with, with the docbook processor over who should be doing HTML and CSS escaping, things like that. They're not meant to work together, and so they do not work together in this way. Um, it's also part of an aspect of the fact that we've added yet another formatting language, so we have two of them in there now. We took a documentation system that was slow and made it four times slower, which uh, is not appealing at all. And you still have to write these template files in DocBook. So it, it's an improvement. It's a big improvement in a lot of ways, but it's not ideal. So you know, I thought about this, and I've been putting stuff out there, trying you know, in my maintainer role to push things in the direction I would like to see them go. And so I had this idea, fairly simple, straightforward idea, dispense with the DocBook stuff entirely, rather than convert Markdown to DocBook to whatever, just go, or ASCII doc, whatever, straight to what you want to do, and, and skip that, that step in the middle. Get rid of the DocBook formatted template files that I think are honestly a real impediment to people who want to contribute documentation. Because that's, it's um, intimidating to look at that stuff and do it. Use one single simple markup processor for everything. And once you're doing this, if it's something simple like Markdown or ASCII doc or Sphinx, you can bring even all the unformatted documents into it because, this, again, they're already almost in that format now. It takes very little to do that. So you can try to integrate things a little bit better. So you know, there's, I put up a few ideas for which one we could use. We could have a, a major bun fight over which one. But my, my intention is to take whatever is shown to actually work, which looks to be ASCII doc at the moment, on that, and not have that fight. And if we do this, we end up with this, you know, some years from now, with this beautiful integrated documentation tree that covers things in a comprehensible way. You can find what you want. It looks pretty when you look at it. It's a nice vision. I hear angels singing when I'm when I think about it and so on, you know, it's just where we want to go. There's just a little problem that somebody has to do this work. And I had put this out for a while and nobody had actually done this work. And I hadn't found the time to do this work. So I eventually wrote up an article on my website and said, well, okay, I don't think we're going to get there. I'm going to merge the ASCII doc stuff for 4.6 probably. And I went off to ride my bike and thought that that was pretty much the end of it at this point. That we would get something that was not what I would like, but better than what we had now, because in the end, you can push back and you can say, we should do things this way. But there comes a point where I think you cannot stop real work that has actually been done in favor of something that you would sure wish somebody would do. That's, that's just not how you actually get things done. So, but then I was a little surprised recently when a um, developer named Nani put out a little patch to the kernel doc utility said, rather than spew out docbook from this thing, let's just put it out in ASCII doc. And he didn't do anything other than that, just format up the, the, the documentation snippets from the source code in ASCII doc and stick them in a file. And then you can do that. It wasn't integrated with the rest of the system at all. But it was a good, it was a first step. It was somebody actually doing something. So I saw this and I said, well, actually, you know, we're almost there. So I took my hatchet to the kernel make files and, and the docproc utility, and made something that could just generate HTML from, from ASCII doc from the beginning to the end, doing the, the inclusions and so on. It took me, I don't know, it took me a couple hours. It was not that big a thing. And then he responded by posting like a 10-patch series of stuff that actually attempted to do the thing right, rather than me just sort of hacking some stuff together. And that's really where things stand. I haven't actually had a chance to play with it that much, but my current intent is to try to get this pushed into shape and to merge it for the 4.6 development cycle. So at that point, I think we will be on our way towards having a rather more complete solution to kernel documentation. And I think maybe we'll be on the phase of, of doing some, some interesting things there. <laughs>
So, like I said, there's a lot of things to argue about, but that's really where I think things are likely to go. So, I feel more optimistic than I did even a week or two ago when I was writing these slides and thinking we were never quite going to get to where we wanted to be. So, and that's kind of my stopping point at this point. It looks like we have a few minutes for questions if we want to do that. And um, I thank you all very much for, for listening. So we need the mic over here. So ASCII doc is a fine format, but to generate competent output, it really does need doc book today. Yes, I, I am aware of that for, for at least some output formats and what you want to do. We may not be able to get doc book out of the tool chain, but I hope we can get it out of the, the workflow. I hope that people don't have to write stuff in doc book. Okay. Cool. Right here. Um, I'm really enthused by that because I think uh, if you've got a bunch of text files, then there are a bunch of text-based markup languages that can be converted into other things um, that make all of that easier. Uh, so I guess the two thoughts I had was, firstly, is that ASCII doc uh, conversion process, or are you interested in getting patches for ASCII, that, that conversion process to happen to the regular text files that are in the documentation directory? Um, and the other thought from a little earlier was, um, is one way of solving that question of who owns, who, you know, who is responsible for maintaining this, this documentation, which may be, say, the memory documentation, is maybe one solution for that to put that text file in a docs directory or a documentation directory in the memory path so that it is obvious that that is your responsibility in, uh, to maintain that. Okay, for the first part, um, would I entertain patches converting the, the unformatted documentation files to ASCII doc? The answer is yes, but not quite yet. I, th I think we need to get this figured out and, and see which way we're going and, f and how it's all going to work and whether, say, ASCII doc really works, that sort of thing. So I would wait a couple more cycles and see how this shapes up before doing that. Once that happens, if I start getting patches adding really nice formatting to really incorrect documents, um, I may start speaking Finnish. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I hope we don't see a lot of that kind of stuff because I would not be entirely enthusiastic about nicely formatted and incorrect documentation. But, um, but I would like to see things move on. And then the other question of moving the documentation into the source directories, that actually came up at the kernel summit back in October when we talked about some of this stuff. And the conclusion that most people came to was that it would be much harder to discover and find if it were like that. It would become very much something that's buried way down deep within a subsystem and, and much less useful to the, to the world as a whole. So I don't, I don't think we'll do that. All right, who's next? I don't. Somebody must have the mic. Um, thanks for your talk. Has it been noticed that the problem you said with maintainers, the skill of becoming a maintainer is not the skill needed to do the job? Is the same, skill, is the same problem that companies have, the skill to become upper management is not the skill required to be upper management? Um, certainly people have noticed this, yeah, because we have a number of the same sorts of things. Some people are rather better at management and dealing with, with developers and so on than others. But for the, all the very same reasons, it's, it seems to be hard to get around. It's the same sort of thing that you can get promoted, in a sense, up to just the level where you can't do things well anymore, and then you stop. So, you know, I'm not quite sure how to improve it, because you do need to understand how the kernel works and how the development process works and so on to be a maintainer. So I don't know that I see that changing a whole lot. We just have to try to educate maintainers who are not necessarily doing things the way they need to do. And that, that does tend to happen. This will be the last question, sorry. Uh, do you think there's any way to make developers care more about documentation than they currently do? Uh, 
any way to make developers care more about documentation than they can actually do. You know, my hope is that by making it more useful and by making it easier to work on and to improve, so that we can head in that direction, yeah. One thing that developers do figure out is that if there's good documentation, then it's easier to get other people to, to help them get things done. It's easier to bring in other developers to push things forward. And once they understand that, they do tend to get a bit more enthusiastic about good documentation. So yeah, I think there is hope. I think in general, developers do care about documentation. They want it to be there. It's just like how we want an awful lot of things to be there. We don't just necessarily want to put it there ourselves. Um, it's, it's the same problem we have in a, in a lot of places and uh, amenable to a lot of the same solutions. We have a lot of documentation. I think we just need to do a better job with it. Excellent. Well, that's all the time we have, unfortunately. But uh, thank you very much for coming and talking to us. All right. Thank you all. And on behalf of everyone here at LCA 2016, I'd like to present you with this gift. Thank you.